Hey everybody, it's Julie. I have enough of my voice back to, to do a recording today. And I'm looking at your uh, week seven discussions on claim evidence and warrant, and I thought I'd model a little bit about how this can actually specifically apply to your cause effect paper. Um, in the past weeks, as, as I've been giving you feedback on your narrative and on your um, com compare contrast or your cause or effect paper, um, what I've been doing often is I've been in the margins of your paper has been giving you feedback. I've been mentioning, okay, so in these body paragraphs, you want to have a topic sentence that orients the reader to um, the discussion, to what's happening in this portion of your of your text. And then you throw out that, not throw out, but you sort of thoughtfully lay out the evidence or the proof that you have, the, the details that make the, the situation stand out for your readers, right? Um, and then uh, I, the, the way I've described how you connect that topic sentence or that claim to the evidence is through this idea of unpacking. And unpacking is just a word that I've used that, that indicates drawing the discussion further. Don't always make this assumption that um, all of your readers see the evidence and that data and the details the same way that you do. So this week you've gotten an interesting description of it through um, this video, Claim Evidence Warrant by John Valier. Okay, and I want to show you how this works for your paper and I'm going to give you an example of this. So let me find my example here. Okay, so I've pulled up an article uh, and I'll include the link to this great, fantastic text analysis by Sam Sachs. Um, uh, article is called Bring Back the Illustrated Book. This is a second paragraph of the three or four page article. It's published in the New Yorker in 2013. And so I want to show you an entire paragraph. Um, and I want to see, I want to show you how you can model this in Toolman's method and then how it sort of matches the phraseology I've been using for your previous assignments. Um, and how you can then use this as an editorial tool as you're finalizing this cause effect paper and as you think forward to your reflective essay that you'll be working on and submitting at the end of next week. That's just a short like two page paper. But this technique um, you can think about, I know um, quite often we don't think about purposefully designing our body paragraphs, but it's easier than it looks. So let me show this to you. So Sam Sachs um, is writing about, actually, let me show you his actual article. I got to go into it, and this is Bring Back the Illustrated Book. And what's cool about this article, this is published in 2013, is that he's talking about the heyday of um, of publishing in like the, 20, uh, the mid to late 19th century, and about how these really interesting images accompanied these very popular texts, like The Adventures of Huck Finn, Bleak House, Vanity Fair. Um, and you can see this one image from... Um, uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that we're familiar with, but we may not realize that the original versions of those books use these beautiful illustrations. And as he writes this this argumentative text, so you can see even in professional writing on the web these are very academic style argumentative essays. So by studying them, we can kind of see what we want to do academically. He uh, includes a lot of images. Uh, I think this one's one of my favorites that he hyperlinks to in this academic text of Alice with this gigantic elongated neck. Um, and this is one of the images um, from 1865 from the text. And so as he's writing about this argument um, about, hey, why don't we have these images lately? He's including support by showing the logos, right, the data. Um, to, to make his arguments. It's really interesting. And at one point in this article, he talks about how in The Great Gatsby with F. Scott Fitzgerald, this guy T.J. Eckelberg um, created an image of the uh, optometry billboard and that F. Scott Fitzgerald, as he was writing the novel and finalizing it, thought the image was so powerful, even though the novel, he was just basically editing and proofreading at that point, he went back in and included that image in one of the scenes because it was it affected him. So illustrators can affect the way writers write, and of course the writing affects the illustrator's interpretation of the events. And so all Sachs is saying in this article, if you want to read it, and I think it's pretty neat, it's very academic and you know kind of hoity-toity in its phraseology, but he's using a lot of data and detail to, to make this argument stick. So I wanted to give you a little background so it makes sense when we look at one of the body paragraphs. So this is what he says in paragraph two. Some of the art from the golden age of the illustrated novel remains a vital companion to the text. So, you know, in, in 
our speak, this is the claim. This is Tolman's claim. This is also a topic sentence. So what's going to happen in the rest of the paragraph is he's going to show that lots of writers used illustrations. Some of this art is vital to the text. It's necessary. So then he explains it with his evidence. So the entire section you see in yellow is evidence. He says it's nearly impossible to go down Lewis Carroll's rabbit hole without envisioning John Tenniel's drawings of a ranting bucktooth Matt Hatter or of Alice eerily elongated after eating the currant cake. And then, of course, in that web article, you can hyperlink to see the actual images. He goes on to say, George Cruikshank was such a brilliant artist that his emotive illustrations of Oliver Twist remain, uh, retain a tenacious hold on the imagination. But we almost never find them in contemporary novels. On the rare occasion they do appear, it is as ironic anachronism. That means ironically told out of time. And Susan Clark's Jonathan Strange uh, and Mr. Norrell, for instance, or Umberto Echoes the Prague Cemetery, both of which are pastiches of 19th century genre fiction. So even though there are these two modern novels, Clark's novel and Echo's novel, what he's saying here is that these novels were written to represent the 19th century, and so, and pastiches, think of patchwork. You can see even by his phraseology that he's writing as an academic, right? But that entire section in yellow is the evidence, that's the logo. So think ethos, logos, pathos. Ton of logos there. But what's in green is the unpacking. What's in green is the warrant, okay? So how he's connecting the evidence to the claim. He's saying the claim is, it's vital. Here's my proof, and here's how I connect it together. So even as graphic novels enjoy a surge of newfound critical appreciation, the common consensus seems to be that pictures no longer belong in literary fiction, and it's reasonable to ask, well, why not? What do we know that Dickens and Twain didn't? So that's a fun, interesting transition to the next point he's going to make. But he's saying, well, why not? I disagree. Um, we've got these graphic novels like Frank Miller's work that's becoming extremely popular. So we modern readers can appreciate imagery, but why are we adding it to our other literature? So he's asking what's called rhetorical questions to extend that warrant. So as you think about the work that you did in that discussion this week, I want you to consider um, as you edit your cause effect paper, because you're so close, you're almost done. Look at some of your body paragraphs and determine, do you have any green? Do you have any warrant? Do you have any unpacking? Or explain the significance of some of this evidence. Do you show you're working through the causes or the effects of the phenomenon that you're talking about? And if you do that, what you can then do is go back to our class um, set up let me see where we're at okay so if you go back to the class and you go back to content and then go to week i'm going to go to writing assignment let's go to these assignments here because some of you have posted your final and if i can get into the final i can show you the rubric the rubric should be attached Ooh, a bunch of you have posted but no even though you've posted i'm not going to look at these until sunday so if you want to continue to edit, by all means. So I'm going to view some of the submissions. I'm not going to look at anyone's actual paper at the moment. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm just going to click in so I can open up the actual accompanying rubric here. So as we scroll through, we can open up the rubric. Okay. Let's see. Let's go back to the rubric. So you guys can see here with the rubric. And I can make this bigger. This is how I'm going to grade those cause effect papers. So in addition to using um, claim evidence and warrant in your body paragraphs to make sure you have sufficient relevant details, go through these rubrics and make sure that you match and that you, you look at your print. I would print this out and I would print out your draft, right, or your, your final. Do you have a clear introductory paragraph? Does it, before you leave the introductory paragraph, do you have a thesis statement? Do you have that good framework of concluding paragraph that sort of mirrors the introductory paragraph? It restates the thesis. It lets the readers go. Okay? Um, that is a good 15% of your paper right there. All right? Then paragraph unity. Um, do you have, a, this, is, this is really good for Tolman or for sort of topic sentence evidence unpacking. Does your topic sentence clearly denote what's coming next? Does it frame it out? Because if you look at 
um, this, we know exactly some of the art from the golden age remains a vital companion. And then he just talks about art from the golden age. All right. Do, is your topic sentence really clear? You know, um, sometimes people say, well, this means as their topic sentence, restate that subject, um, pull out, um, the paragraph, any body paragraph from your paper. This is a good editorial trick. Pull it out from the body of the paper and determine does everybody understand my subject? Because each body paragraph should be read as a standalone document, okay? Support, that's the evidence, the chunky evidence in the middle. Coherence, does the support relate to the unity? Are you unpacking it enough? Now, selection of sources. Make sure you go through the assignment guidelines. I believe it says six to eight sources. If you have two or three, you're going to get well below expectations. And if you have no sources, then that's going to certainly affect the, the quality of, of your work. Sources are current as appropriate. Now, that depends on what type of argument you're making. If you're making a humanities argument, as I've stated before, um, you can have older sources. But if you're making a, uh, an IT, a science, an economics-related argument, probably more timely sources are necessary. And scholarly. I cannot emphasize this enough. You have got to use scholarly sources. Please do not use about.com, facts.com, Wikipedia, um, the first couple of Google hits. I mean, sometimes they're good. Sometimes it's the NIH and you trust them. But balance quality academic research with time spent on Nova Library databases. You have to have Nova, Nova Library sources as described in the assignment guideline. Now, I'm working until four today, which is another five and a half hours. If you want to reach out to me for help on formatting for APA and text citations, an APA style reference list and how you cite your sources, you bookend them as we've talked about in previous weeks. Grammar um, is 15% of your grade. You know, punctuation, word level accuracy and sentence level accuracy uh, is important. And then of course, following the assignment guidelines, you've chosen an academic topic and that you have applied appropriate formatting to this. All in all, this is 100 points, but I do believe this assignment is worth, I want to say, 25 or 30% of your overall grade. So edit via the Tolman method in one round, and then edit um, your text and proofread it by using the rubric as a checklist, and you're going to be in fantastic shape. So again, you can use Tolman as one way to, to check through this and the phraseology and the way that I've been giving you feedback as we go has been modeling this all along, but I haven't really been using his name yet. Okay, so uh, I wish you luck. Do this, do your editing and proofreading with fresh eyes, work with a partner, work with the, um, uh, per, your professor, work with one of your classmates. Um, change your environment, maybe print it out and go sit outside on your deck if you live in the Northern Virginia area. It's going to be in the high 70s today. So whatever you can do to make this work for you, um, use Tolman to your advantage, carry it into the next, uh, into this paper, into your reflection paper. Use those rubrics. You, you, if you do that, you'll be a half letter grade higher than you are, probably already are. All right, I wish you great luck. Take care.